Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. The flood of immigrants continues on the southern U.S. border. The House is wrestling with an emergency bill to address it. Earlier in the week, the U.S. House voted to authorize a lawsuit against the president for allegedly overstepping his constitutional authority regarding the health care law. Meanwhile, ISIS has continued to purge Christians and other religious minorities from northern Iraq. My next guest is here to address all of it. He's the U.S. Congressman from the 1st District of Nebraska, a member of the House Appropriations Committee, as well as the U.S. Caucus on Religious Minorities in the Middle East. He's also a co-sponsor of a bipartisan resolution to raise awareness about the plight of Iraqi Christians. I spoke with him a little earlier in our D.C. studio. Here's my interview with Congressman Jeff Fortenberry. Congressman, I want to start talking about comprehensive immigration reform. This is a term we hear a great deal. The bishops are even advocating for this. You are not totally at peace with that term. Well, that's an interesting way to put it. I don't like the word comprehensive. Whenever you hear comprehensive on Capitol Hill, yeah. you can be assured that it will be a bill full of things that would never have seen the light of day if they were voted on in an individual fashion. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with comprehensive immigration form. It's complex, mm -hmm. it's multi-layered, but there's really four components. It's border security, interior security, streamlining legal processes, and then foreign policy considerations. I want to shift to this terrible crisis on the border. All these minors coming across and young families uh, really risking their lives to come here. It's obvious they want a better life. They want something more than they have in their home country. How would you describe this crisis, and to what do you attribute this latest influx of immigrants? Well, it's, it's a tragic crisis in a number of ways. We're calling it a surge of border children, mm -hmm. and it's primarily due to three factors. Um, desperate poverty, ungoverned space, and an exploitation of our laws. Mm -hmm. And I think there's three approaches to getting this back under control. Protecting the border, protecting the children, mm -hmm. and preventing the problem. Now underneath that, you have to break that apart and get to the various complex layers. Mm -hmm. You have to send a clear and consistent message, and it would be helpful if the president did this, that anyone who is coming here illegally will be returned home. We have to consistently demand that the countries, particularly of Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, set up the right type of repatriation processes mm -hmm. so that children are treated humanely and are reunited with families. Then the third component of this is more robust border security because this is in disarray at the moment. The children are suffering, communities are suffering. If we get this back under control and create that systematic ordering of process once again, mm -hmm. then you can consider the cases where there is a just need for asylum mm -hmm. for children or others who are running from some form of persecution. Yeah. Now, you were a fierce advocate, one of the primary advocates for this 2008 anti-trafficking bill. Correct, proudly so. And, and in that bill, it carves out those from Central America, particularly minors. They can't be turned around and deported quickly. Right. They, they, they have to remain. You can't do it. Do you support now changing that law? And is that part of what drew particularly the minors here at this point? Well, certainly it would be incorrect to dismiss this as a factor. It could very well be a factor. The broader factors, as I said, poverty, exploitation yep. of our law, as well as ungoverned space. Mm -hmm. But the initial framework, particularly from the meeting, the media, was that it's the 08 law's problem. The 08 law was designed to prevent, to, to help people who are victims of human trafficking. I was not only uh, involved, I was a, a key leader yeah. of this and proudly so, particularly on the child soldiers portion of this. Yeah. Uh, we could go ahead and change the law. I will support that, that treats children from Mexico differently from Central America, given that that is a corollary to this. But it's important to remember that this problem didn't start in 09, 10, 11, 12. It started in 13. And that's when, the pre after the president had announced that he was going to decrease the number of deportations, uh -huh. that created the conditions whereby exploitation of laws could take place. Mm -hmm. The other factor here is, remember, these are children who are being exploited by human traffickers, coyotes as they're called, who sometimes, particularly young girls, are being subjected to horrific mm -hmm. crimes, and you can just use your imagination. Yeah, it's the how. human trafficking that, the, that 2008 the, law was designed to it, curb. And remember, trafficking is being brought somewhere against your will. Mm -hmm. It's not being brought somewhere in concert with being paying someone. Sure. So this is the complexity of the 08 law. Certainly, we could go ahead and change that portion of it. To me, that's reasonable. But there are a variety of other factors that have led to this surge of children on the border. John Boehner has put forward a new bill. It would change that law. It would grant the president 
$659 million, create more immigration judges, which you right. need, um, and hopefully, according to the bill, hasten the deportations. Do you support this bill? Well, I'd, like, I'd rather use the term processing and repatriation for the humane treatment of children rather mm -hmm. than just deportations, because that's what we have to do here. Yeah. We have to get the border back under control, processes in place that can quickly determine the situation and status of the individual child, and then the humane treatment, the guarantee of humane treatment once they are returned to their home country and reunited with their families. That's the three-step process that needs to take place here. Then we can establish, once again, some order down there. Remember, communities are suffering as well as these children. Mm -hmm. the, the hearings within a week, which would be one of the yes. mandates of the, of the law, you'd support that? Or is Absolutely. that too tight a requirement? The administration's already crying foul. They're saying the president's going to veto this, and it's asking too much to say you're going to turn these, the, these hearings around in one week. Well, right now, as I understand it, the hearing could take place between two years and five years mm -hmm. based upon the caseload. Something has to be done here, Raymond. You can't have a situation that is in chaos and disorder and have a good and vibrant and just immigration policy, yeah. which, by the way, has been the hallmark of American law and I think that one that we should return to. It is a core part of who we are. It's the heart of America, having a good, strong immigration policy. But when there's chaos and disorder in any part of it, you undermine the ability of the country to be generous in the first place. Congressman Luis Gutierrez has been a major advocate of comprehensive immigration reform. He had this to say about what the president's next step might be. Take a look. Look, I don't want to say that the president said this, but here's my understanding from having met with him and talking to others. I believe that millions upon millions of undocumented workers who have roots in the community, who have American citizen children, who have established businesses, who would benefit from the Senate bill, who, who would benefit from the Senate bill, I think the president's going to act. Your response to what you're hearing there? Well, I have two responses. First is, I think it's unconscionable that the, tech, that the president was in Texas a few weeks ago raising money and shooting pool while there is such a crisis on the border. I think he should have visited the border, understood the situation firsthand, and addressed the nation about what he was going to do. A clear and consistent message from the president would actually be the strongest of signals that we can send to help get this crisis back under control. The second issue is the president himself, a while back, said, I don't have the power to do this. Yeah. I cannot change the immigration laws like this myself. Now, if he's saying something different, that would be really, really odd. Well, the president just asked for $3.5 billion. He said he needs that for enforcement to, help, to hasten this, this immigration review process and the, and the judges needed to review these cases. Congress is saying we're not giving him that money. We're not giving a blank check for that much money. We, uh, we will, I will support tomorrow the figure you cited earlier. The $659, the 659 million. $659 million, mm -hmm. which gets us a couple months down the road that helps plug the holes in the system, brings the National Guard potentially to the border to give the Border Patrol some relief so that they can actually be about enforcing the law, sets up the conditions in which cases are heard more quickly, and then the humane, proper treatment of children as they are returned to their families back in Central America. Mm -hmm. The president, we give, that's going to take some money to do all those things. So I think it is legitimate to try to spend this money, but by the way, it's already budgeted. This is not new money. Mm -hmm. This is what we call reprogrammed money from ex the existing budget I see. to move toward this crisis. Now, some of your colleagues, Republican colleagues in the Senate, are opposed to this, this uh, bill entirely. Uh, I just bumped into Senator Ted Cruz. He's been whipping votes in the opposite direction against the Speaker and, and so many in your caucus. Jeff Sessions, Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama, had this to say. The President is preparing to assume for himself the absolute power to set immigration law in America. Well, I'll just enforce what I wish to enforce. The absolute power to determine who may enter and who may work, no matter what the law says by the millions. Our response now is of great import. It will define the scope of executive and congressional powers for years to come. If, the pre if President Obama is not stopped in this action and he exceeds his powers by attempting to execute such a massive amnesty contrary to law, the moral authority for any immigration enforcement henceforth will be eviscerated. Do you see it that way? Okay, if we do nothing, children will continue to surge across the border, 
and they will be placed in facilities that are costing the U.S. taxpayer 250 to $800 a day, and that includes military facilities mm -hmm. across the country. Their hearings will be in two to five years. 50, I believe the statistic is as much as 50 percent of, of, of people will not show up for those hearings, if I recall correctly. This is a crisis. It would be helpful if the president led in a forthright manner. Mm -hmm. If we got the border un under control, repatriated the children properly, and then had the case hearings, the, the, the judges in place to hear cases as they came along quickly. I, I just, you, to not act allows this to continue, but I don't think it necessarily sets up mm -hmm. uh, a further problem. It might be a partial solution at the moment, but inaction allows this situation to continue. And I just don't think that's a prudent course. Nancy Pelosi, uh, s former Speaker Pelosi, had this to say. She referenced the bishops and their advocacy for a just immigration reform. Listen. I, I always reference the Bishop, National Catholic Con uh, Bishop Conference of Bishops statement in which they said, baby Jesus was a refugee from violence. Let us not turn away from these children and send them back into a burning building. That's the bishops. And that's, so we have to do this in a way that honors our values, but also protects our border and, and uh, does so in a way that the American people understand more clearly. Is that what's happening through this bill? Are we sending these children into a burning building? I, I don't understand the inconsistencies in, in her statement. Protects the border, but also allows anybody who just shows up in. Mm -hmm. Again, you, can, you cannot have compassion when there is disorder and chaos. You will undermine the ability of our very generous immigration system, which ought to remain the hallmark, I believe, of one of America's key policies. You'll undermine the country's ability to be generous if you have this chaos continue. The proper repatriation, returning of these children to their families, sends a very strong message to these coyotes, mm. to people who are hu engaged in human trafficking, who are exploiting families and children, that this is going to stop. It cost the Central American countries about $10 a day to house and protect these children properly mm. versus 250 to 800 to in not, the United States. In the United States. Wow. To not act is gravely irresponsible. Let's move on to the Senate. Harry Reid is saying there's a possibility that he may attach the Gang of Eight bill to the, the immigration reform bill that was rejected by the House, not even taken up by the House. He will attach that to a supplemental spending bill. Is that a possibility? And what are you and your colleagues uh, prepared to do if that should happen? Well, first of all, it's very hard for me to care about what Harry Reid says. Uh, they might as well hang a door sign out over there out of order. Uh, they have, the House has passed 350 plus bills in this session. 350 sit over there in the Senate for their consideration. We are trying to engage in normal legislative function. And the dysfunction in the Senate uh, is just astounding. It is jamming things up till the end. It is creating these conditions where you have huge bills that are must pass at the end, and then things that wouldn't normally be able to get through get attached in the end. Mm. Uh, we'll have none of it on our side of the aisle. Yeah. So if he attaches it in the Senate, it's not a fait accompli. Would it have to still come back to the Absolutely. House or no? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Let's move ahead to Israel. We continue to see this terrible carnage on both sides. More than uh, nearly 1,500 Palestinians killed, 53 Israeli soldiers, three civilians so far. There could be more now in Israel. Do you see a cessation to this violence? Is there any way to stop this? Is there a diplomatic approach that might work here? The whole situation is heartbreaking. Um, Israel, we, we wouldn't tolerate for 30 seconds rockets coming into an American mm -hmm. city that potentially kill people uh, from a sworn enemy who has said, we want your total destruction. We wouldn't tolerate that in a moment. And yet at the same time, all of our hearts are breaking to see the, the, the human casualties, the casualties, the, the, the nature of the violence. And then you ask yourself, what does this look like in 20 years? Where do we go in 20 years? Uh, I don't have a great answer. I don't have a good answer to your, to your uh, proposition. It is a desperately awful, grave conflict uh, between two entities that you, you just hope someday you could figure out a way to break past this impasse. Well, and, and our normal, the normal allies the United States would go to, Egypt or, or Syria or, or um, Jordan, uh, none of these players have any real sway in this situation any longer. Isn't that part of the problem as well? We've sort of, we, we, we've, we've so uh, 
mistreated in some ways the allies in the Middle East. This is a very good point. I don't think regional instability is a help to Israel. Uh, Egypt seems to be rebounding and recalculating itself and establishing some stability again and hopefully the relationship with Israel with both e between Egypt and Israel as well as the United States improves dramatically. Mm -hmm. They can have a role as a potential broker in this over time but right now it's all collapsed. It's I just pure violence. I want to play something for you. It gives you some some insight into what Israel is dealing with and the Hamas situation. This is Mossab Hassan Youssef. Now, he is the son of a Hamas leader. He converted to Christianity. He was interviewed on CNN the other day. Listen. That Hamas does not care about the lives of uh, uh, Palestinians, does not care about the lives of Israelis or Americans. Mm -hmm. They don't care about their own lives. Uh, they consider uh, dying for the sake of uh, their ideology a, a way of worship. Hamas is not seeking coexistence and uh, uh, compromise. Hamas is seeking uh, conquest and uh, taking over. Cards for either of these players, Israel or Hamas, to come to peace. And can peace, is it possible when you have an aggressor like this on the other side of the border from Israel? What has gotten to be even more difficult in the last year is Fatah, the ruling authority in the uh, West Bank, has drawn closer created some alliance with Hamas and that was very very disturbing uh, in many ways because you had some hope again with the quiet but very real cooperation that went on in the West Bank between the Palestinian Authority Israel as well as America we helped establish those relationships that somehow this could transcend Hamas could diminish remember they seized the election they were democratically elected and then they turned around and killed their opposition mm -hmm. and so the gentleman who you just quoted uh, it's a powerful eyewitness to certain realities there that we, I don't think we fully understand here. How somebody could act with such irrationality, subject their own people to being killed, not have any interest in pursuing peace, mm -hmm. and provoke this type of violence. It's very hard for us to understand. I, I don't have a good answer as to the way out. Last week we opened the show with uh, an expose on what's happening to the Christians in Iraq. And when you see the pictures, when you see the destruction of Jonah's tomb, when you see these monasteries being taken over, uh, this report, St. Ephra Ephraim, Syriac Orthodox Church uh, on the east side of Mosul, ISIS converted it into a mosque and in installed loudspeakers for, for prayers throughout the day. Uh, the Syriac Catholic Church in the old part of Mosul looted and torched, and all the Christians have been driven out. You have sponsored a bipartisan resolution. What would that effectively do? What does it ask for? Well, first of all, I think all of us, not just here in the United States, but internationally, if there is a responsible community of nations left, mm -hmm. we must get our mind around what is happening there. It is a genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, this group called ISIS, the Islamic State of, uh, of Iraq Israel and Syria, and Syria or, uh, Iraq, Iraq and, and Syria, Syria uh, are uh, uh, fanatical zealots who fly the black banner of death. Who would have imagined a month ago they would have taken large swaths of Iraq with very little resistance? Mm -hmm. Mosul is the second largest city in Iraq. For 1,600 years, it has had a flourishing Christian community. Now, no Christians are left, not one. And what else happened was when ISIS entered there, they spray painted this mm -hmm. on the doors of the remaining Christian families in their businesses. Yeah, which has become a ubiquitous sign all over the internet. It's the Arab letter for N, which stands for Nazarene, which is a denigrating term to the Christians used by some. Mm -hmm. Except they didn't spray paint it in gold. They sprayed, spray painted it in red, blood red. Mm -hmm. And they said to the Christians, you have to leave, convert to Islam, or die by the sword. Hmm. Oh, and, and, they are, and they are leaving. They fled. Your resolution requests what? The resolution basically asks that the international community expedite humanitarian aid there to help the Christians as well as other religious minorities who are decimated. It calls upon the UN Security Council to act, which by the way just passed a resolution 15 to nothing mm -hmm. unanimously to provide humanitarian assistance in Syria. So we have a template there yeah. so that it's not the United States alone. We would be participating with the international community of trying to move some humanitarian assistance. Mm -hmm. This is a desperate situation Tomorrow it's hopeless, in a few days it's lost. So this is why we've tried to aggressively move this resolution before the United States Congress. Hopefully we can get a vote soon. I, I'm so gravely disturbed by this. I, I was able to meet with the uh, Archbishop of Baghdad, the Archbishop of Mosul, as well as the Patriarch of the Syriac Church 
recently in Congress. And um, Raymond, it just makes you want to cry what these men are suffering. No, it's horrible. It's horrible. The communities are decimated and probably never to return. But the people that are run to that Nineveh plane, they should be protected. Something should be done. Now, your resolution asks for the Kurds to be given some support at least, encouragement. What is the real effect of the resolution, though? The real effect would, again, first of all, heighten awareness mm -hmm. of the situation and maybe mm -hmm. slow down the deterioration, hopefully move some humanitarian assistance, encourage yeah. the Kurds to act in a responsible manner as they broaden their horizons and potentially become the de facto stabilizing yeah. new state right. in the area there. And then that may perhaps over time lead to some sort of Christian autonomous, other religious minorities such as Yazidis in a more autonomous zone where they can participate in a larger governance of that area, mm -hmm. maybe in some type of strategic partnership with the Kurds. That's what I'm hoping mm -hmm. because I am very worried about Baghdad regenerating itself mm -hmm. here and providing protection. Where, how's it going to happen? How realistic is passage at this point? Well, we're going to do everything we can. Most members are interested in this, but as you're quite aware, we're at the end of the uh, yeah. summer session, and, uh, and it is just a desperate scramble to get all kinds of things done, including the border bill, as yeah. well as we just passed a VA reform bill. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, that is actually going to be signed into law, so yeah. there's something constructive there. You also uh, voted to sue the president. A majority voted, slim majority, mostly Republicans, all Republicans, I think, no Democrats, to sue the president. Why is that necessary? The Constitution of the United States. Uh, there's a balance of power in the Constitution. There are three branches of government. The legislature makes the laws. The president enforces, ex executes the law. Mm -hmm. The judicial branch interprets the law when there is a question. Mm -hmm. So because the president, regarding the new health care law, has unilaterally and substantively changed it 24 times, mm -hmm. we consider this to be basically a violation of his duty uh, as executive officer. And so mm -hmm. we're instead of this getting over politicized, right. move it to the court system, let the court decide. And the and this will go directly now to the Supreme Court, I imagine. Yes, the House, the, the it's the speaker who would sue him, correct? No, it is the House of Representatives. The whole House. That is wow. correct. It is the institution. That's what makes this unique. It has mm -hmm. never been done in the history of the Republic, but it is a recourse that the legislative branch is trying to say to the president mm -hmm. If we don't decide on something, therefore, it's our problem, right. not the executive problem, branch's problem. If the law says something that you don't like, you can't unilaterally change it. You have to bring it back to Congress. Mm -hmm. That's the way the system's supposed so to work. So it goes right to the Supreme Court, I would imagine, yes? I don't know or the, the fullness of that court. process. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, the ambassador at large for religious freedom, that position has sat vacant since last fall. The president just appointed Rabbi Nathaniel Saperstein. Now, this is being viewed as a controversial appointment in some quarters. Some say this is a guy who, who's opposed to the Hobby Lobby ruling. He thinks it's troubling that uh, an organization would be granted its religious liberty and have a right in, in what its employees do, or the, the coverage offered. He also uh, works for an organization that has been militantly pro-abortion in the last, uh, th throughout their history. Your thoughts on that appointment? Well, uh, I'll have to learn more about it, to be honest with mm -hmm. you. I, I don't know his background well. Um, I think that the deeper principle here of religious liberty, this is the International Religious Freedom Commission, mm -hmm. but the deeper principle of religious liberty of having some limits on governmental power. The purpose of the government is to protect rights, not to confer rights, not to give mandates that actually make people choose between obeying the law and obeying that sacred space, their deepest mm -hmm. right to religious freedom as well as their conscience. If that's his position, that, that's indeed troubling. But I will just tell you, we've got so much work to do in terms of international religious freedom in Iraq and other places throughout the world mm -hmm. where this most fundamental basic of human rights is under threat. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, he's going to have a lot thrown at him very rapidly. Yeah. I, I frankly would like to build a relationship. I'm trying to build a relationship with the larger commission because mm -hmm. I see their work as becoming more and more per important yeah. as people around the world recognize this, this basic freedom we're not understanding it well, and we're not protecting it properly. Mm -hmm. No, and it's not part of the foreign policy puzzle, which it needs to be, Correct. and the calculations. Yeah. Congressman Fortenberry, thank you so Pleasure much for being you. here, as thank always. You.